Dear Father, we thank you for what we learned tonight in Daniel 10. Now we're moving to chapter 11. We pray you'll really show us some amazing and powerful, relevant, pertinent things that we need to understand here uh, for the times that we're living in now. So please bless us with a large measure of your spirit Amen. in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I titled this Both Ends Against the Middle. Have you heard that expression before? Both Ends Against the Middle? I think by the end you'll see why I've titled it that way. Now, we're going to go all the way back to Daniel chapter 2. Way back several weeks ago, when King Nebuchadnezzar had that dream of that multi-metal image, gold, silver, brass, iron, iron, and clay, we saw that those different metals represented different kingdoms or empires down through time, starting with Babylon, the golden head, and then came the silver chest and arms, Medo-Persia began to rule the world when they conquered Babylon. They lasted until 331 BC, and they were conquered in the Battle of Arbella by Greece, represented by the bronze waist and thighs. Then in 168 BC, Greece fell to uh, Rome in the Battle of Pydna. Rome began to rule the world for almost 500 years before it was divided up into 10 segments or fractions, and they're represented by the 10 toes there of iron and of clay. And then of course, the next thing the king saw in his dream was the stone that destroyed the image, became a great mountain for the whole earth, and that represented the second coming of Christ and the kingdom of the Messiah. Now, I think we mentioned that this sequence of kingdoms that you see right there, that sequence is repeated three times in the book of Daniel. How many knew that? Three repetitions right in the book of Daniel. All right, now the first one, the first repetition was in Daniel 7, when Daniel had a vision of four beasts, right? The lion with eagle's wings, then came the bear, raised on one side, three ribs in its mouth, then came the leopard-like three beasts with uh, four wings and four heads, and then came the dragon-like, terribly strong, dreadful beast with iron teeth, and then it had ten horns on its head, and then out of those ten horns, Daniel saw the little horn coming up, right? And then after the little horn came up, he saw a judgment scene up in heaven, and then the kingdom was given to Christ and to his people. All right? That's in Daniel 7. So we learn that there's parallel prophecies here. So the, the lion represented Babylon, the bear represented Medo Persia, raised on one side because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. Then came the leopard representing Greece. The four heads represent Alexander's four generals that divided up the Greek Empire when Alexander died. The fourth beast with the iron teeth matches up with the iron legs. That was the iron monarchy of Rome. The ten horns represent the ten divisions that came from the fall of Rome. Uh, the barbarian tribes that grew into the western nations of Europe. And then we saw the little horn coming up represented papal Rome that began to rule the world with the union of Christianity, with the state, the Antichrist power that put a man in place of Christ as the head of the church. And then we see Christ getting the kingdom at the end of chapter 7. Now, the second time that this sequence is repeated is in Daniel chapter 8, and that's where Daniel has a vision of the ram with two horns that was destroyed by the goat with a great horn between its eyes. And when the great horn broke off, four horns came up in its place. And out of them came that little horn again that became exceeding great. And uh, that represented uh, <clears throat> papal Rome there as well. So we see that uh, chapter 8 started with Medo Persia. That was the ram. And then the goat was Greece. The big horn was Alexander. The four horns that came up were his four generals, equal to the four heads on the leopard-like beast, and then the little horn coming up represented Rome in both its pagan phase and its papal phase, and all that Rome did in history. All right? So that's kind of what it looks like. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then we have pagan Rome and papal Rome, and then the judgment, and then finally it all ends up with the coming of Christ and the kingdom of God. All right? Does that make sense? That was kind of a quick review of where we've been in our journey through the book of Daniel here. 
Now, I want to look at the final repetition. This is what we're building up to tonight. The final repetition of that time sequence, that sequence of empires, is repeated for the fourth and final time in, guess what? Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11. All right, so follow me closely. We're going to look at the major repeating and enlarging of this great prophecy of empires down through time. Chapter 11. Let's read verse 1. Also, I in the first year of Darius, the what? Mede. The Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. All right? So it's interesting, just like chapter 8. Remember chapter 8? Chapter 8 started with which power? Medo-Persia. Yeah, Medo-Persia, the ram there, right? Remember, Babylon wasn't... And so just like in chapter 8, chapter 11 starts with the Medes, or Media. Now, which one is not mentioned? Persia. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. Now I will show you the truth. Behold, they're going to stand up yet three kings where? Persia. In Persia. So we got Media... In verse 1, now we got Persia. What should we expect next? Greece. Greece. And sure enough, it says the fourth will be far richer than they all. By his strength, through his riches, he'll stir up all against the realm of what? Greece, yeah. Or Greece, right? How many can see we're following the same sequence here? Mm-hmm. You see it? Starts with Media, Persia. Now we got Greece. What should we be looking for next? Well, verse 3 says, a mighty king. That's that big horn we saw back in chapter 8, representing Alexander the Great, right? And so this mighty king in Greece will stand up, and he's going to rule with great what? Dominion. Dominion. That's very interesting, because it says that way back in chapter 7, that third beast representing Greece, it says dominion was given to See the connection there? Dominion. This is Greece. All right, Alexander the Great, first king of Greece, is mentioned in verse 3. What do we got? Media, Persia, Greece, Alexander the Great. Let's keep going. When he will stand up, that's Alexander, his kingdom will be what? Broken. Broken and be divided into how many parts? Four. How many heads were there on the leopard of Greece? Four. Four heads. How many horns came out of the goat when the big horn fell off? Four horns. And so here, yes, again, we see four divisions of the Greek Empire after Alexander's death when he was broken. Now, now Daniel 11 is going to elaborate on these four generals. You guys remember the names of the four generals that came out of Greece? Ptolemy. Cassander. Wait a minute. Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Ptolemy. Right? Those are the four. All right? So now it's going to start elaborating on these four generals. Now, we haven't had the big elaboration on these four generals until this point in the prophetic sequence. So these are the ones who assumed power after Alexander's death. They took the four winds, the four different directions. They carved Greece up into four parts. Now, verse 5 says the king of what direction? South. South. We know from history that that was who? That was Ptolemy. And he took the area of the Greek Empire that was associated with Egypt. In the south, okay? So, I was talking about Ptolemy there. What's it say about him? He would be what? He'd have a strong kingdom. Now, let's go to verse 6. In the end of years, they will join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the what? North. And we know from history that Seleucus was the one that took the Greek empire, the section of the north, And so he becomes the king of the north reference there. Um, And it's interesting that Seleucus headquartered his kingdom in the area of the Euphrates River that was formerly occupied by Babylon. Babylon. All right? 
king of the north, associated with the area there around the Euphrates, formerly called Babylon. Now, get ready, because now we're moving out of Greece. What we expect next? Rome, Rome right? So it's going to take us to Rome now in the prophetic sequence. And notice how Rome is identified in the next verse in chapter 11. Here we go. Then will stand up in his estate a raiser of what? Taxes. Who was the great taxer of the people in the Bible? Augustus Caesar, right? That's how Joseph and Mary ended up in Bethlehem where Jesus was born because... Augustus put out and created all the world to be taxed. And so it's talking about this taxation, the taxer, Augustus, Roman emperor, in the glory of the kingdom. And then it says, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And you read the book of Daniel. When it talks about the covenant and the prince of covenant, who's it always talking about? That's Jesus, right? That's Christ, who came here to confirm God's covenant with his people. But it says he would be broken. Did Rome as an empire break the Messiah the prince? Yes. Okay, so the same Rome that raised the taxes killed the Christ, nailing him to a Roman cross, guarding his tomb with a Roman guard. Now, we got, we've done meat in Persia, Greece, Greece divided into four parts. We talked about the king of the north, the king of the south, Ptolemy and, and Seleucus. Now we've come to Rome. What should we expect next in the sequence? That's right. After pagan Rome and the pagan Roman emperors like Augustus, who came next? Papal Rome, right? Remember the little horn represented pagan and papal Rome? So here we go, verse 31 of chapter 11. Arms will stand on this part. They will pollute the sanctuary of strength, take away the daily what? Sacrifice and place the abomination that makes death. Now this very similar language here that we saw back in Daniel 8. And Daniel 8, talking about the little horn. Remember it said he would take away... Uh, the, the daily sacrifices, he would cast the sanctuary down, he would put in place another earthly, man-centered system of salvation, that abomination of desolation. And so this is clearly here talking about papal Rome. So you can see we're right on track, and you see the consistency of the Bible, right? <clears throat> it's always the same kingdoms, always coming in the same chronological order. Am I right? Uh -huh. Babylon, you know, Persia, Greece, got four generals dividing up Greece, then we got Rome, and then we got Papal Rome, right? It's amazing to me the, the consistency that you find in the Bible when you take time to read it out. All right. Now the next verse is going to accurately, accurately describe the reformers as they resisted the authority of Papal Rome during what we call the Dark Ages. Check it out here. <clears throat> the people that do know their God. After introducing the, the, the papal power that would cast the sanctuary down and take away the name sacrifices, instituting a false system of salvation, putting a man in, in the church as the head of the church in the form of the Pope. Then it says, the people that know their God, and that's a reference there to the Protestant reformer, they will be strong and do what? Exploits. They that understand among the people will instruct many. People like Martin Luther, was he instructing people? Yeah, he was instructing them in the Bible, the Word of God. So did John Wesley, and so did other people we could name, these great reformers. They did great exploits, they instructed many, yet they will fall by the what? Sword, and by flame, and by captivity, and spoiled for how long? Many, many days. And during the Dark Ages, isn't that what happened? These reformers that were instructing people in the Bible, they were captured, they were tortured, they were imprisoned, they lost their belongings, they were spoiled, they, they, uh, they even <clears throat> killed in the most inhumane ways during many days of the Dark Ages. So that's clearly a reference there to that time period. Now, verse 35 says, some of them of understanding 
will fall, to try them and purge and to make them white even till when? The time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So this dark age period in which these reformers were being tried by fire, that would extend to what's called the time of the end. So this verse takes us up to 1798, which marked the end of the dark age period, the end of the papal supremacy. Now, the next four verses are going to further expand on the behaviors of the little horn power that we have identified as papal Rome. And these verses were about three. The next four verses are going to describe the activities and actions of papal Rome that actually bring condemnation on that power in the judgment that takes place up in heaven. Notice what it says here. The king, talking here about papal Rome now, will do according to his will. He will what? Exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Remember in Daniel 7, we saw that little horn had a mouth speaking great thing? See that there? See the connection? And uh, it says in Daniel 8, he would exalt himself, magnify himself, even to the place of the hope, prince of the hope. Okay, then it says, and prosper until the indignation is accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his father, nor the desire of what? Is there a church out there that forbids people to get married? No. Yeah, people are wrong, right? The priest can't get married. They don't respect the man's desire of women, right? Nor regard any God, and he will magnify himself above all. Then it says in verse 38, but in his estate, here it goes. This is the one that brings great condemnation on the Lord. He will honor the God of what? Or God of forces. Did the early Christians honor the God of forces? Did the early Christians, the disciples of Jesus, ever reach out to the state for state power? No. For military power? No. No, but the little horn would, it says. And a God whom his fathers do not really honor with what? Gold, silver, and precious. That's honoring material wealth, material possessions. Thus he will do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and cause him to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So papal Rome, we look at history, it, it, it unfolded just like it says here. Rome trusted in material wealth, accumulating gold and silver and precious stone. They trusted in military power and political power to rule over and oppress people. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. As I said, did the early Christian church rely on silver and gold? And when Peter and John saw the guy at the temple, what did they say? Silver and gold have I none. Mm -hmm. right? Did the early church rely on political power to any extent? No, so papal Christianity was a strange contrast to the religion of Christ and the disciples, right? Then verse 40. At the time of the end, remember that date, 1798, shall the king of the south, what was the king of the south? Egypt. That was Ptolemy in Egypt, right? Will push at him, push at him, and the king of the north, that was Seleucus in the area formerly known as Babylon, will come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. So this verse, <clears throat> have I lost you guys? You still with me? This verse describes the king of the south uh, coming against the king of the north, at what time? Yeah. At the time of the end. Right? Did I make that up, or am I, is that what the Bible said? It describes the king of the south coming at the king of the north at the time of the end, <clears throat> around 1798. Now, since we are near, what verse are we in there? 40. 
Is it clear the beginning or the end of Daniel 11? What's the end? We're getting near the end, right? Since we're near the end of Daniel 11, and we've come far down now from the original kings of the north and south. Who were they? Who were the original kings of the north and south? Ptolemy was the south, and Seleucus was the north, right? But we've come down a long way past them now. We have to realize, guys, that the identities of the king of the north and the king of the south have changed by the time we come to this verse at the end of the day. They've changed. So we have to look for history for a fulfillment of this prophecy right here. <clears throat> Obviously, Egypt did not attack Babylon in 1798, did it? Did Babylon even exist in 1798? Mm -hmm. No. So what could the king of the north and the king of the south here be around 1798? What kings could we be talking about? What kingdoms in history? How many remember back on our Revelation seminar, Revelation chapter 11, talked about a kingdom that was called spiritually called Egypt? Do you remember that? And where the two witnesses were killed? Spiritually called Egypt? Mm. And, and how many remember in Revelation 14 and 17 and 18, it talks about a spiritual Babylon? Remember that? Amen. Okay, so, which world powers exhibited the spiritual characteristics of Egypt and Babylon in 1798? Well, we should probably ask, what were the spiritual characteristics of Egypt and Babylon, right? Well, we know that Egypt, that's the power in history that denied the existence of the true God and resisted his will. That when, when Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh said, I don't know God, I don't know Jehovah, and I will not let his people go. Right? Denying the true God, resisting his will, that's the spiritual characteristics of Egypt. And Babylon, in history, had the spiritual characteristics of idolatry and sun worship and using the power of the state to force people into false worship. Isn't that what Nebuchadnezzar did? He made a big idol, and he used the power of the government to force people to worship the idol that he set up. That's the spiritual characteristics of Babylon. So the powers that were manifesting these spiritual characteristics of Egypt and Babylon in 1798 were France. Remember, France is where they denied the existence of God and resisted his will. And then the spiritual characteristics of Babylon, of course, in 1798 was papal Rome. Papal Rome with their idolatry, using the state force people to worship in a false manner according uh, <clears throat> against the Bible. All right, so let's just put it, in, let's put it in that way now, verse 40. At the time of the end, 7 and 8, so the king of the south, spiritual king of the south, atheistic France, push at him, the spiritual king of the north, being papal Rome. Now you see that phrase, push at him? Hmm. It means to gore like an animal with a horn goring another animal, killing it or wounding it severely. So, did atheistic France wound the papacy in 1798? Mm -hmm. Inflicting what appeared to be a deadly wound? Remember our history guy? Remember when Napoleon sent General Berthe? into Rome, they captured the Pope, took him out of Rome, put him in France in prison, and he died there. And it was the wounding of the political power of the papacy. Just like it says. Another amazing fulfillment of prophecy with great historical significance. Now, what has been the result of that event? That right there. What has been the result of France pushing at papal Rome? in 1798. Well, look at this. After 1798, the world saw a proliferation of 
atheism, humanism, secularism, socialism, communism, Marxism, because the, the principles of the French Revolution were actually picked up by other people like uh, Marx and Lenin, and they started establishing regimes and, and governments all around the world based on these principles, yes or no? Yes. It was a big movement, right? <clears throat> and that all happened after 1798. But then there was something else. After 1798, the world also saw a proliferation of democratic republicanism, free market capitalism, individual liberty, freedom of conscience, and a strong, influential form of Christianity that flourished in the Western world called Protestant Christianity. Am I right? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, check it out. When you lay these movements that all came up after 1798 side by side, which, which of those ideologies, which one of those philosophies politically, religiously dominates in a given population? You know, if you watch the news and you're, you're attuned to current events, you know that there there has been a constant struggle over which of these socioeconomic, religio political philosophies will dominate a given population, right? I mean, we've got people in America today that came from countries like those that are listed there on the right side of the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And where a given population leans often depends on the results of elections, doesn't it? Do you agree with that? It depends on the results of elections. But here in America, it's interesting, here in America, thankfully, it depends on more than just the results of elections. Because we have some key factors in America that are designed to withstand any given election or elected official. Am I right? What are the key factors that we are kind of have unique here in America or have had? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the separation of powers, that we have these three branches of government, what are they? Legislative, executive, and judicial. We call that the separation of powers, right? So the American system is unique in that a major change in our culture, in our society here, cannot result from a presidential election alone, or a congressional election alone, or even the appointment of a Supreme Court justice alone. There are powerful checks and balances that were put in place in our unique form of government by the founding fathers of America to keep that from happening. Amen? Amen. So those are really key factors there. Now, of the four things that are listed, these key factors in America, remember, we learned in Revelation's uh, seminar that America plays a prominent, pivotal role at the very end of time. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So, of the four factors here, these are very important, guys. Of the four that are listed there, number three, the separation of powers, is really, when you think about it, the most important one. Because that's the one that protects all the rest of the freedoms that are guaranteed to all Americans, especially minorities of all kinds, whether it's an ethnic minority or a uh, religious minority or a minority of any kind. We are protected as minorities by this separation of powers. That's where the checks and balances are, right? Because if they pass a law in the legislative branch, that puts you in a position as a minority of being oppressed, you can always appeal to what? The Supreme Court. And they can overrule your oppression. Am I right? Yeah, thank God for that, right? Because if you read Revelation very carefully, you gotta figure out that if you're gonna be true to God in the last days, you're gonna be in a very small minority, aren't you? 
and you're gonna need some protection. Now, that situation right there could never exist under Papal Rome. You know why? Because in Papal Rome, the king of the north, the church and the state are both what? They're one. And the Pope himself is legislator, executor, and judge. Right? All in one. Giving him total power and total authority. Listen to this. This I'm quoting now from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1997. Look what it says. Quote, the Pope enjoys by divine institution supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. Hmm. Supreme, universal authority and power resting in one person over the souls of everybody under his jurisdiction. <clears throat> so in the papal system, is there a separation of powers? No. No. no, it's all concentrated in one person at the head, right? But listen, according to the prophetic book of Daniel, a sea change is going to happen. That's going to allow these key factors here to be overridden in America and then worldwide. And once these key factors are overridden, we're going to see a resurging papal Roman power emerge to reclaim global dominance like it enjoyed during the Dark Age period. In other words, that will mark the full healing of the papacy that they do. Now look at verse 40. After getting wounded by the king of the south, it says the king of the north, papal Rome will come against him. Who's him there? The king of the south that wounded him. They're going to come back against him like a what? A whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships. He will enter into, and that word there means invade the countries and overflow, that means inundate, and pass over means to completely cover. So this is a prophecy that papal Rome, the spiritual king of the north, is going to just take over every country in the world before the end. Invading, uh, <clears throat> covering, inundating, you know, those are the kind of words it's conveying there. So clearly Daniel 11 concludes with the prediction that papal Rome, the spiritual king of the north, in the last days will regain the power. Conquer the spiritual king of the south, which is godless secularism and atheism, and then eventually invade, inundate, completely cover all the countries of the world with its long sought after union of the church and the what? The state. And the state, the god of forces that the papal power has honored in the past and seeks to unite with in the future. Revelation 13 puts it this way. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was what? Healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. So according to prophecy, clearly we end up with papal dominance on a worldwide scale, complete with the enforcement of what is called the mark of the beast. But to get to the mark of the beast, and what is the mark of the beast? That's the forced observance of the mark of Rome's authority, which is the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. To get to the point where people can be forced to follow a religious law concerning worship, something has to happen here in America. In the Great Controversy 443, it says, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. That's the union of church and state. That's the full healing of the wound. <clears throat> All right, so an image of the beast is formed when the church uses the state to accomplish her religious objectives, and that spells out religious laws. So guys, if America is ever going to make an image of the papacy, a church-state union, then these key factors will have to be what? Compromised eliminated, or ignored, right? As long as these things are in place, we cannot have the mark of the beast here. Right. 
right? So something has to change. And lastly, events 131, it says, when Protestantism stretches her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, our country will repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant Republican government and make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan that the end is what? Near. Near. Now you see the word there, uh, what does it say? Our country shall repudiate. How many know what the word repudiate means? Hmm. I looked it up. No guess. In the context of law, repudiate just means to refuse to fulfill or discharge. Hmm. So that means the Constitution in America would not necessarily have to be changed or amended. Its principles merely need not be applied. Are you with me? The principles just don't need to be applied to certain people or certain groups. Do we have a time in history when the constitutional rights of individuals in America were not applicable to a certain group of people? Who were they? Japanese. Remember in World War II, they rounded up the Japanese? Those were American citizens. But they had the wrong ancestry, and so they rounded them up. Put them in concentration camps. Here in America? That's repudiating our Constitution. Now, of course, it was all done with, a, with the good of the country. Mm -hmm. So, we can already see this spirit beginning to manifest itself. Remember what came after 17? Look at the list again. <clears throat> Are there people in America tonight that espouse those principles? Yes. yes. Are they that espouse those principles in America willing to deny other Americans their constitutional rights? Yes. Their right to the free exercise of their religion, their speech, their assembly, their press? Yeah, people are being socially pressured, shamed, fired from their jobs, canceled, even killed by people who believe in these principles and think everybody else should too, right? Am I right? Yeah. So secular humanists today are attacking, if you look at this First Amendment, there's two clauses. Congress, the legislative branch, cannot make a law to respect the establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. So those that are for atheism and secularism and humanism, which, which part are they attacking? The free exercise, right? They're saying, no, you cannot exercise your Christian beliefs because they conflict with my principles and my opinion. But look, remember this? Also after 7th day, we got Protestant Christianity, we got Democratic Republicanism. Are there people in America that believe in this? Mm -hmm. Are some people who believe in these principles prepared to deny other people their constitutional rights? They're willing to deny other people the right to live in the country that does not have an established religion or the proscribed, or I should say prescribed, mandated religious observances of any kind. By the way, do Americans have a right to live in a country without any established religion? Mm -hmm. To be atheists if they want to? Mm -hmm. And espouse those beliefs if they want? Yeah, right? But there are people that say no. And so we have those on the, what might be called the religious right that are attacking the Establishment Clause because they're hoping to make America a Christian nation using political power and legislation honoring the God of what? Right? Force people to be Christians. You see what's happening here, guys? <clears throat> Satan is doing what? 
both ends against the middle. Because he's working with the king of the south to foment godlessness, secularism, humanism, atheism, immorality, rebellion, anarchy, chaos, stuff you read about in the news every day, right? But then he's also got the king in the north that likes to do legal religion and legislate worship and join the church and the state together and create the image of the beast and make people worship God. You see what he's doing? Now, in the battle between the king of the north and the king of the south in the last days, prophecy points the ultimate triumph of which one? Neither. Huh? I'm just saying between these two, who ends up with the upper hand? Oh, no. The king of the north, right? So it's interesting that in effect, one kind of leads to the other when you think about it, because the legal enactment of the king of the <clears throat> south create such a state of things in society, such confusion, such chaos, such immorality and godlessness, that it actually sort of triggers a, a pendulum swing in the opposite direction with legal enactments of the king of the north that are viewed as the only solution to the chaos, confusion, and suffering. Off by the king of the south. Does that make sense? So again, the devil's playing both ends against the middle, but he has an agenda to end up with the triumph of the king of the north. Very clear in Revelation and here in Daniel. Back in 1991, Father Malachi Mountain Martin published a book about the political ambitions of the Vatican. He was the professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute at the Vatican, and his book was entitled The Keys of This Blood. And the subtitle says, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the New World Order. So Rome was thinking there needs to be a New World Order and we need to be the head of it and we're going to have to conquer communism and the West, right, to do it. <clears throat> Inside the book on page 455, it says the goal of the papacy is a geopolitical structure for the society of nations designed and maintained according to the ethical plans and doctrinal outlines of Christianity as taught by the Roman pontiff as the earthly vicar of Christ. So they want the Pope to be the head of a, what's it say, structure of society of all the nations so the ethical plans and doctrines of Christianity can be spread and uh, well, they don't use the word enforce, but we know that's been the past history. <clears throat> so God saw this coming and warned us in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Remember it said Revelation 13, 3 says, all the world wondered after me. So here's a sample of what we can expect. This, this is an interesting photo because where is Pope Francis in that photo? The United States. Yeah, you recognize the background, right? That's the, he's at the podium of the United Nations addressing the heads of all the states of the world, right? So there we have the spiritual king of the north, the king of spiritual Babylon, if you will, addressing the United Nations. That's a very interesting picture. So the Vatican wants to take the lead in bringing all the nations together and setting them on a unified course. And the stated goal is a new future with a one world government of all the nations governed by the principles of the papacy. Now, history has shown us the result of enforcing those principles by the strong arm of the state. What happens when, what happens when the church gets control of the state? What happens? People, die. People get killed, right? Mm. By the millions in the past. Just like when Nebuchadnezzar called for everybody to bow down to the image that he had set up, Papal Rome will call for all to bow to the idol Sabbath that Rome has set up in place of God's Ten Commandment Sabbath. But then in verse 44, we're getting to the end of the chapter now. Tidings from the east. What direction is Jesus coming from? East. Like lightning flashing from the east. So tidings from the east, the direction of Christ coming, and of the north. Now, the Bible uses the word north to describe the place of God's throne. 
Remember Lucifer in uh, Isaiah 14 said, I want to sit on the mount of a congregation of the sides of the north. And some tidings from the direction of Christ coming from the place of God's throne are going to trouble him. Trouble who? King of the north. King of the north. Going to trouble him. Therefore, he's going to go forth with great fury <coughs> to destroy and utterly make a way. And you look up that Hebrew word make a way there, that phrase, it means to seclude, ban, make a cursed many. So Rome apparently here with the help of apostate Protestantism will effectively isolate those that are practicing biblical Christianity. <clears throat> and they're going to be banned from being able to do what? So I'm thinking about in a practical way. By Revelation yourself. 13 says they cannot what? By yourself. By yourself, right? They'll be banned from the economy. They'll be isolated from everybody else. And they will be pronounced accursed. And finally saying that they should be killed if they won't receive what Revelation 13 calls the mark of the beast. Then it says the king of the north will plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. And yet, here's the good news, he will come to his what? End, and none shall help him. So according to verse 45, the king of the north, spiritual Babylon, papal Rome, will threaten the remnant church of God with its political and religious authority that it will have at that time. And we recognize that to be the forced observance of Sunday. Rome is saying Sunday is our mark of authority over the world. We transfer solemnity from Sabbath to Sunday. We put our commandment in the place of God's. And they're willing to enforce that by law. And that will be the final act of lawlessness under the guise of a zeal for God, actually, that will bring about the destruction of Satan's worldwide system and worldwide order that uh, has been carefully crafted and will come about in the last days. Now, verse 1 of chapter 12, that read, read earlier, we'll get to it again next week. At that time, in other words, when he goes out to, to ban and isolate the true people of God, trying to practice biblical worship and keep God's commandments when they're banned and isolated and cursed, at that time, Michael will stand up. What did we just learn? Who's that? Jesus. Yeah, Christ will stand up. The great prince who stands for the children of your people. There's going to be a time of trouble like never was since it was a nation at that not same time. But at that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone that is found written in the book. Praise the Lord. Michael will stand up. Now, before we go, can I have just five more minutes? A classic demonstration of how Satan is working both ends against the middle is the current crisis. Where is the world's current crisis right now? I mean, it's not down at the Titanic. That was a <laughs> tragic, terrible tragedy. But that's not the world crisis right now. <clears throat> Somebody said, it. where is the world crisis? In Ukraine, right? Ukraine is a classic Demonstration of how Satan is working both ends against the middle. Who do you recognize in this picture? Who's in the middle there? Putin. Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, right? How many knew that Putin has closely aligned himself with the Russian Orthodox Church and its patriarch? His name is Kirill. How many knew that? Yeah, they're good friends. Because they are uniting in an effort to reestablish Russian orthodoxy as the state religion in Russia. So we got the political head and the head of the church working together to establish Russian orthodoxy as a state religion in Russia. What does that sound like? The king of the north or the king of the south? King of the north. That's king of the north behavior, right? Now get this, the Russian Orthodox Church used to be headquartered in what city? It used to be headquartered in Kiev. Hmm. That's over in Ukraine. That used to be the headquarters and sacred city 
of Russian Orthodox Church, they lost it. And guess what? They want it back. They want it back. And all that it stands for. They want that back under Russian control. So Putin's attack on Ukraine is driven, at least in part, by his great disdain. Whenever he's interviewed, what is, what is Putin, what is he uh, always getting in the face of the West about? I mean, what really gets under his skin about the, the West, our, our country, and, and Western Europe? NATO. He hates the fact that the secular West has become so liberal and immoral as to allow homosexuality and transgenderism. He hates that because he's afraid that that's going to move where? <laughs> Into Russia. Hmm. And he says, we don't want that. We don't want that immorality. We don't want that confusion. We don't want that God godlessness. <laughs> that's interesting. Here. And the secular West, Western Europe, is getting more and more secular, isn't it? And more and more immoral. And they're expanding further and further east. And so Ukraine, in the middle of Western Europe and Russia, is kind of the flashpoint over this continent. Okay? Between the spiritual kingdom of the North and the spiritual kingdom of the South. How that battle ends, we don't know. But according to prophecy, the ongoing conflict ultimately ends with the triumph of state religion over secular ideology and secular practice. And it's interesting to me that the Pope of Rome, have you heard this? What does is, what is Pope Francis say about this? Just recently he said, he said, I'd be happy to solve the conflict with Russia and Ukraine. I'm ready to make peace with them. I'm ready to broker a peace. I just need both of them to cooperate. Now, I'm not the Pope, but if I was the Pope and I was trying to bring this conflict to a solution, you know what I would say? I would sit down with uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and I would say, you can solve this whole problem if you just make Orthodoxy. Because what's the religion in Ukraine? Orthodoxy, right? If you just make orthodoxy the state religion here in Ukraine and resist the influx of <coughs> secularism and the West and all those things that Russia does not, and I will help you to do that, right? But nobody has a better record of uniting the church and the state together than papal Rome. And so he's hoping to save the planet from World War III and broker a peace between these two powers. Now, before we go home, I, I need two more minutes, I think. Let's make this very personal. Guess what, guys? Satan's goal is to get you aligned with one of these two kings. That's Satan's goal for you and for me. He wants to get us aligned with one of these two kings right here. Right? And I just want to say... Do not align yourself with the king of the south. If you align yourself with the king of the south, you know what you'll do? You'll deny Christ and everything he stands for. And you'll end up oppressing people if you line up with the king of the south. By the same token, don't ever align yourself with the king of the north. You know what you'll do if you do that? You will deny Christ and everything he stands for. And you will oppress people in the name of Christ. And they were the side of the So who should you line up with? You gotta line up with the king of all kings, amen? Amen. Be true to his word, partake of the spirit of Christ, or you will succumb to the, the power of one of those two kings. If we don't have the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we will fall into one of those two ditches. How many know that Jesus walked the fine line between the conservative Pharisees and the liberal sects? He did, didn't he? Because they were working both ends against the... 
And by the way, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees finally united to crucify Jesus, right? Mm. Because he rendered to Caesar what was Caesar's, and to God what was God's. And may God help us to do the same. Amen. Because one day, it says the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Amen. How many tonight want to line yourself up with the king of all kings? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing prophecy in Daniel 11 that speaks to our day and time and what's happening in our world right now. Thank you for showing us these things. We have the devil's playbook in our hands. We we understand how he's working both ends against the middle. He has these two kings, these two ideologies, these two philosophies that are competing, that are dividing the world, they're dividing our country, they're dividing families. And Lord, we don't want to be divided. We want to be united with Jesus. Amen. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the principles of his kingdom and his constitution that will endure forever. Lord, please save us. In your kingdom is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.